Welcome. I'm often hearing on YouTube how the changes in solar activity affect Earth's temperature. And most of what I hear is completely wrong. The sun produces three methods of affecting the Earth directly. One, it's radiant energy, and that is in the form of the total solar radiance. That supplies 99.99% of the incoming energy to the Earth. So small changes in that might have an effect on the Earth's temperature and we'll see how much. The other thing it produces is charged particles in the form of the solar wind and coronal mass ejections, and those have effects on the Earth as well in terms of things like aurora. The third component of this is magnetic field, and that's carried along with the solar wind and coronal mass ejections. And while it in and of itself does not carry much energy, the magnetic field can help reconfigure the Earth's magnetosphere, the Earth's magnetic field, and allow more access to those charged particles. So we'll take a look at all of these and see what they can actually contribute and compare those with some of the other factors that cause the Earth's temperature to change. The first thing is we need to know what the Earth's temperature would be. There's a very simple formula to take a look at that. This is the formula that I was talking about. And if you want to see how it's derived, you can look it up online. But basically it is the temperature to the fourth power equals the luminosity of the sun, that's L0, times one minus alpha, alpha being the albedo of the Earth, divided by a bunch of constants and the distance from the sun squared. That's the inverse square law. The temperature to the fourth power equals 1.35, 10 to the 32, times one minus the albedo over the distance of the sun squared. Now this not only applies to the Earth, but it applies to any planet without an atmosphere at a good distance of D from the sun. Well, here I've done all the arithmetic for you for the four rocky planets plus the moon. There's no point in applying this to the other planets because uh, they are gas giants and they don't actually have a surface that you can work from. Now, you could do it for the various moons there, though. When you apply this to Mercury, you find that its theoretical temperature should be 437 degrees Kelvin, and the, the observed surface temperature is 452 degrees Kelvin. Now, there is a little bit of a difference there, but that's probably within the uncertainty of the temperature of Mercury, because we don't have that many observations of it. But that's basically because Mercury has very little atmosphere. Venus, on the other hand, has a huge difference between the theoretical temperature and the observed temperature. The theoretical temperature is 229 degrees Kelvin. The observed temperature is 726 degrees Kelvin. And that's because Venus has a very thick atmosphere, mainly consisting of carbon dioxide. The Earth is slightly warmer than it should be by 30 odd degrees. And that's because it has a moderate atmosphere with just a little bit of carbon dioxide in it. The moon, which has no atmosphere, is basically the same temperature, 269 versus 272. And Mars is very similar as well. It has a very tenuous atmosphere. There's some interesting points here. Note that Venus, according to this formula, should be several degrees cooler than the Earth. That doesn't seem to make sense. Venus is closer to the Sun. The real difference comes in the albedo of the two planets. Venus reflects a lot of sunlight, all but 24% of it. The Earth absorbs a lot of sun's sunlight, about 69% of it. So there's a factor of three in the amount of energy that these two planets absorb. And that's why the Earth actually ends up being somewhat warmer theoretically than Venus. Well, first of all, we should take a look at how much the solar output varies. And that's the variation of the total solar irradiance shown here on the right. The red is the daily values. The green is a long-term average value. The average variation is 0.1% over a solar cycle over a period of 11 years. That means that the average variation, the deviation from the average level of solar in output is 0.05%, so it's half of that. So if you went into a grand solar minimum, for example, for an extended period, the luminosity of the sun would be dropping by about 0.05%. Now, if you plug that into the previous formula, that translates to a change in the temperature of the Earth of 0 0.03 degrees centigrade. So a negligible change. So going into a grand solar minimum will make almost no difference, even if it's for a very long period of time. So the conclusion comes that solar cycles do not affect our temperature. 
Even an extended grand solar minimum would be a change of only 0.5 or degrees centigrade or less. But there are other sources of energy that we should look at. Sunspots, flares, coronal mass ejections, the solar wind, and an outside source, cosmic rays. Let's start with sunspots and their alter ego, faculae. Sunspots are these dark areas on the surface of the sun. They effectively dim the sun. However, they are cooler and emit less energy. So that's why you get dips in solar output when a sunspot goes across the disk, which I'll show you later. However, sunspot groups are always surrounded by bright faculty. These are areas that are hotter and emit more energy. And as you can see, the area of the faculty and the extent of the faculty is much greater than that of the sunspots. And they also last longer. When the sunspots have disappeared, which they do over a period of a few weeks, then the faculty remain from perhaps several rotations. So the overall effect is that the sun emits more energy when there are sunspots around due to the faculty than is reduced by the amount of energy lost from the sunspots. Well, let's see what the dimming effect of a sunspot is on the sun. Here on the right, you can see a picture of the sun with a, a set of sunspots on them. And there's a light curve here going over something like about eight weeks. And when the sunspots are on the sun, they are there for about 14 days. That's half a solar rotation. So that's the time that they're visible. And you, as they come over the limb, they are less effective than they are when they're at sun center. And then as they go towards the other limb, uh, their effect decreases yet again. The overall dimming here is about 0.34% in this particular case, and this is a large sunspot group. So the average dimming over this two week period is going to be 0.15%. However, it's very rare to get these large sunspots. Uh, for most of the cycle, you don't get them at all. And then when they're on the sun, they're only there for a couple of weeks. So the average dimming over a cycle is going to be basically negligible. OK, what about flares? They produce a lot of energy, as we know. Flares make only a tiny contribution to the energy received by the Earth, though. You can see here four examples of flares being detected uh, in the total solar irradiance. The scale on the left hand side of parts per million. So this is 20 parts per million is just about the two sigma detection level. Three sigma is usually what we strive for. So all four examples here are only just barely detectable. However, there's something else you should know about these particular plots. The first one, A, is a sum of 42 X flares, the biggest flares around, and you barely get a detection. B is a compendium of large M flares and some small X flares. You get quite a nice detection there, but you require 90 of them to be able to get that to that level of detection. You take the smaller M flares, then it takes 267 of those to get a significant detection. And if you take C flares, you need nearly 1500 of them to get a bare detection. So it takes a lot of flares to produce a barely detectable amount. And you can see they only last for a relatively short time. In these uh, minutes here, you've got something like five or six hours worth of data, and they're only above detection level for a few minutes. So they would be a negligible contribution to the overall solar output. Coronal mass ejections or CMEs produce also a great deal of energy, something like six times 10 to the 25 joules for the larger ones. But the trouble is these are spread over a huge volume of space. And most of the energy that reaches the Earth is diverted away by the Earth's magnetosphere. So the efficiency of transfer of energy from the coronal mass ejection to the Earth is very, very poor. It's estimated to get up to 2 times 10 to the 13 joules can be deposited in the Earth's system. And that is about 0.009% of the solar energy we get in a second. And these events are very rare. So the, the conclusion is that this is not going to contribute very much to Earth's energy input. But the solar wind is continuous. But when we look at the numbers, it also is negligible. You can calculate the kinetic energy of the solar wind, which is a half mv squared. And it turns out to be something like 0 0.013 watts per square meter. And that's a tiny fraction of the total solar irradiance. So again, it's a negligible input. 
Well, cosmic rays are very energetic particles, but the problem is the flux of them is negligibly small. You can see here some of the least energetic cosmic rays with energies like 10 to the minus 8 joules. You only get one of those per square centimeter per second. Uh, so when you multiply that up, that is a tiny fraction of the Earth's input. Remember, you're getting 1360 watts per meter squared from the sun in radi direct radiation. So this is orders of magnitude less than what you need to affect Earth's temperature. Now, some people argue that these cosmic rays help create clouds, and those clouds then shield the Earth and you get a drop in temperature. OK, so let's take a look at that. The Earth's magnetic field is supposed to be weakening. The sun's magnetic field is supposed to be weakening. And so consequently, you would expect far more cosmic rays coming into the Earth. So we should have expected that Earth's temperatures would be dropping as a result of this increased cosmic ray flux. But that's not the case. We've had some of the warmest years on record in the last decade. So this story just does not hang together. So let's summarize. Variation in solar radiation varies by 0.1% in 11 years. So that's a very small amount over a long period. Sunspots are very rare by comparison, and they contribute 0.15% over a couple of weeks, a few times during a cycle. And so that, again, is going to be a very small overall contribution. Flares, X-class and above, contribute 0.0001% of the total solar irradiance. So again, is negligible. Coronal mass ejections, 0.009%. Again, negligible. The solar wind, 0.0001%. Again, exceedingly negligible. And I was remember assuming all the maximum parameters for the solar wind, not the minimum one. So there's probably another order of magnitude in there if we allowed for that. And cosmic rays are just so many zeros I'm not going to bother to pronounce them all, but they are negligible, energetically in this case. And the amount of clouds they produce is a matter of contentious argument and probably is very small, and it's in the wrong direction for what we've been seeing as far as global temperatures are concerned. So we can rule those out as well. There are some effects that uh, produce much bigger effects on Earth's temperature. The Earth's orbital eccentricity changes the amount of energy we get by 7% over a six month period. It's at maximum in January and it's minimum in July. The seasonal changes depend on latitude. For example, at the equator, at the, for equinox, you get 100% of the radiation because the sun is directly overhead. At the solstices, you get 92%. So that's only an 8% shift, but it's still quite a significant amount. At 45 degrees, it's much, much larger. You get 37% when the sun is lowest in the sky, you get 81% when it's highest in the sky. That would be a change of 44% over a six month period. So that's quite a large change. And at the pole, it's even more extreme. And of course, during the winter months, the pole doesn't see any sunlight at all. So that's 0%. And when the sun is at the highest, the best you can do is 40%. So there's a very large change there too. These all dwarf effects like sunspots, flares, cosmic rays, and the solar wind. So what can we conclude from all of this? The major source of variation in energy input from the sun is solar radiation. It only varies by 0.1% over an 11 year period and is not enough to affect our temperatures or weather. All these other effects are small by comparison to orbital and seasonal effects. Thus things like the grand solar minimum will have zero effect on global temperatures, even if it occurs, which it isn't at the moment. So until next time, Stay safe and goodbye.